time for the word of God. If you're ready for the word of God, shout yeah, yeah. Amen. Would you turn with me to the gospel of St. Luke, chapter 10, beginning at verse 30. And you already know this, but it is our tradition to stand in our church for the reading of God's words. So if you would stand all over the building, this is the last time I'm going to ask you to do this, just out of respect for his word. I'm going to begin at verse 30. And I think I'm going to end at verse 35, and I'll be complete our thought there. The Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 10, beginning at verse 30. When you have it, would you shout amen? Amen. Some of y'all look nervous. Y'all ain't got it yet. I'll give you time. For your convenience, the scriptures will be found on our stage on the left and the right, so that you don't have to struggle with trying to find it. I see a few people still carry their Bibles. Some people still carry their Bibles. Ain't that something? God. Yeah, we got the electronic That's devices true. and stuff, but I heard pages turning, see? That's old school. Yeah, I appreciate electronic and everything, but they're going to pull out the Bible, yeah. lift the pages, old school. Yeah, I want to make sure it's there. Amen? The Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 10. Familiar passage of Scripture, but I want to turn there for your reading today as we go further. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. So he, he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to the inn, and took care of him. Verse 35, on the next day when he departed, the good Samaritan that is, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said this to him, take note, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. Yeah, I'm going to read that verse again. Verse 35, the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, he pulled out his own money gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, whatever total more expenses you had, when I come again, I will repay you. I want to use for a subject this morning, radical hospitality. Radical hospitality. Father, bless your word on today. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to have a brief conversation with you this morning about the subject of radical hospitality. And I talked to you this morning um, out of a conversation that God has been having with me for quite some time about this church and this ministry in regards to hospitality. And I call it radical because anytime something is radical, it's an extreme departure from the norm. So the conversation that I'm having right now is very calm, but it's designed to change the direction, the focus of our ministry, our operations, how we approach what we do, and more importantly, why we do what we do. This story is traditionally known as the parable of the Good Samaritan. And it's a very familiar one to those of you who are Bible students. But for the sake of those who may not be familiar, I want to assume that you know the ins and outs of this story. So to give you a little bit of background text, the question was asked to Jesus, who is my neighbor? That was a question that was posed to him. And we talk about people because here's the thing. Everybody that's close to you is not necessarily neighborly. You follow what I'm saying? Everybody that's sitting in close proximity to you who may be your neighbor is not necessarily neighborly. And so when they asked the question, Jesus was a master at telling stories that made you think. I, I love him. I study the way he ministers. I study the way he uses stories to emphasize a point. So instead of coming straight at it, he begins to tell a story. 
and helps people draw their own conclusions. See, Jesus appealed to people's logic many times when he spoke. So while you're questioning, while you're trying to test me in terms of who we should be giving energy and attention to, let me tell you a story. So the story goes that there was a man who was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. He was going down. He was going home. And as he was going home, he was attacked by a group of robbers, a group of strangers. And what they did was they robbed him of his clothing, his possessions, and they beat him and left him half dead beside the road. That's the setup. Here is somebody who was innocently going home, minding his business, who fell among thieves. I, I, didn't expect, I didn't expect this to happen. I wasn't planning for this. This was not on my agenda. It probably started as an ordinary day on a road that he travels all the time. But on this particular day, he fell upon the nefarious actions of somebody who had uh, issues that he did not even bring up himself. And he fell among thieves. Notice how, it's, how the, the direction of his man's life. He, he's going down to Jericho. And as he's going down, he fell among thieves who robbed him and stripped him and left him for dead. Now, there, there are several characters in this story that play a significant role in creating this conversation that we're having today. First, there are the robbers who stripped him. And then there were the priests and the Levites who avoided him. And then there was the Samaritan man who helped him. And any one of them will be, will be very good preaching points. But that's, but that's not where I want to go today. Today, I want to focus on something or somebody that most people don't pay attention to. There's one additional character, and that is the innkeeper. Because while the robbers stripped him, the Levites avoided him. Thank God the Samaritan helped him. But the innkeeper kept him. And the reason why I want to focus on his presence in this story is because to me, to me, the Holy Spirit enlightened to me that he showed the true transformative power of hospitality. Jesus was making a point. By definition, your neighbor is the other person or anybody that's in front of you. The point that Jesus was making with this story is that everybody is your neighbor, that humanity is your neighbor, not just those you are familiar with. Not just those who share your same political beliefs. Not just those who do share your same skin color. Not just those who are in your uh, approximate location where you live, but that everybody, every person you meet is actually your neighbor. That humanity is your neighbor. And so for those who are trying to make excuses and say, I have an obligation only to those I know, Jesus expanded it and said, you have an obligation to those you don't know. Are you with me so far? The primary Greek word for hospitality in the New Testament is a combination of two words, philo, which means love, and xenos, which means stranger. The word is philo, xenos, which means to, to love or to be a friend of strangers. So when we talk about hospitality in the Greek language, it is to show love to strangers. Why am I emphasizing that? Because, because it's not just to those that you are familiar with. And I call it radical because hospitality has become a lost art in our society. Because we have a tendency to show love only to those we are familiar with and get this and we shun those that we have no real investment in. So the people that I know that have an investment, I, I have an obligation, almost a pull to show love to them, but here we are being radically told to show the same kind of energy to somebody you've never met before. Oh. So you see, the problem is we tend to be tribal in how we move. We're tribal, we're, we're clannish, we're cliquish in our presentation. And when we are that way, we are limiting our ability to be impactful to those who are beyond our borders. What am I saying? I'm saying your life has to be bigger than us four and no more. That our lives have to be, if we're going to be impactful, we can't just look for familiar faces. Even in a church service like this, we tend to look for people that, we, that we're used to seeing. There's, there's Sister Mary, there's Brother Bob, there's whoever. But, but in reality, our eyes should be keen. 
Our eyes should be trained to look for people that I've never seen before and that my ministry actually kicks in when I see an unfamiliar face. That in reality, the people who come among us for the very first time, and I thank God for our first time visitors here and our second time visitors. But in reality, our hearts should be so in tune that when I see a new face, I make a beeline for you because I am someone who was given to hospitality. That's what Paul said we should do. Paul said that we should be given to hospitality. That means that we have a lean toward and a bent toward hospitality. And hospitality is our calling. Can I say something to you at the church? I think that we should be known for being hospitable. If we're not known for every, anything else, we should be known for being hospitable. That anybody who ever darkens our door or walks into our service, that they may not be impressed by our singing, and they may not be impressed by the preaching, and they may not be impressed by the facility, but what they should walk away is with an overwhelming feeling of being hospitable. That I met a group of people who never saw me before, didn't know my name, wasn't from my part of town, but they were so overwhelmed with the hospitality of this church. Oh, to be the kind of church that when people mention the impact church, that the first thing comes to their mind is hospitality. That they've been trained to be uh, sensitive to people that they've never seen before, and the spirit of hospitality leaps out of them where they don't even have to know your name, and they're not even turned off by your skin color, and they're not turned off by your gender. They're not paying attention to what you drove up in or what you wore or what kind of bag you carry or what kind of shoes you wear but there's something in me that leaps into action so that I can be hospitable and I want this church to be the kind of church that when people mention the impact church's name it is synonymous with hospitality from the parking lot to the front door to the preaching to the greeting everything that we set up in our church including the song that we sing and the fellowship opportunity is because we are trying to make Minister to those, not just the people that we know, but the people that we don't know with the spirit of hospitality. We look for opportunity to show care and concern for others. And if there is none, we create one. We make up a chance. I make up a reason to talk to you. <laughs> make up a reason to come by and see how you're doing. The innkeeper stands out to me because he was entrusted with the care of a stranger. So he was not just showing hospitality, but he was being a caregiver to a stranger. Can I go deeper this morning? In a lot of, main, in a lot of ways, he reminds me of the church, who is not just charged with winning souls, but for caring for the souls that we win. Sometimes I think the church is very good at winning souls, marketing, letting people know we're here, evangelizing, preaching. We do a very good job of drawing people into our services, but our ministry does not stop there. We must go beyond just bringing them to the church and begin to care for the persons that we have just won. And I'm concerned sometimes because I think the church, the church reminds me of people who would have a baby and then leave it on the doorstep. Who, who would do that? That's crazy, right? Who would go through all of the pain of carrying a baby for nine months pushing them out of your body, and instead of bringing them home to be cradled and cared for and nurtured and trained, you would leave them on the doorstep. But to be quite honest, I'm saying this as an observation and not a criticism. We are adept at getting people in, but we're not as good as keeping people in. We're not as good. We don't have as much energy. We have energy about coming, come to my church. Come visit my church. Come see my pastor. But once they're here, uh, we're not as good at taking care of the people that God has given to us, the people that God has given into our care. And so even though we have bodies that come in, the needs that they've been brought to this safe place for has not been met because we don't realize we have a dual responsibility. You see, we have a dual responsibility of not just bringing them in, but providing care and concern and teaching and training for them. And so the sad thing is, after all the work we've done to get you here, now that we got you here, we dust ourselves off and say, my job is complete. But in actuality, your job is not complete. This man was given the responsibility of caring for a stranger. I'm going to say this to you because many of us are in this situation right now. The job of being a caregiver is not an easy one. I realized this when I, when I took care of my mother before she transitioned. It is not 
an easy one. Even for somebody that you love, the job, the responsibility of being their caregiver is not an easy one, let alone somebody that you don't even know. When you think about the concern, the care that's on your mind, the energy that it takes to be there and be effective in that person's life at a time when they cannot take care of themselves, it is not an easy job, even for somebody that you have great affection for. So much less for somebody that you never met before. And this is why the church is having such difficulty in ministering to souls. Because many of the people that come into our churches are strangers to us. And yet God has called the church to offer care and concern for a person you've never met before from the wrong side of the tracks from a different part of town. As if they were your family. Ooh, isn't that a challenge? That I'm going to leap over chairs and get to you as if you were, let me put it straight, I'm going to care for your child as if it was my child. I'm going to look out for your son as if they were my son. I'm going to respect an elderly person and give them deference and give them care and give them support and reach out to them as if it were my mother. Oh, that's putting it on another scale, ain't it? I, I'm, I'm going to be there for you and provide ministry and provide help as if you were mine. And yet that is what God is calling each of us to do, to look out for, to care for people that you are not physically related to. Because I have radical hospitality. So write this down. Most people have a challenge with this because it is expensive. It costs something to serve. That's why a lot of people don't do it well and they don't do it long because they underestimate what it costs to really serve somebody else. Can I say it real frankly? Most of us are self-serving. That if what I'm doing doesn't serve me in some way, doesn't help me in some way, doesn't place me in a better position in some sort of way, I lose interest. And even if I go out of my way to help you, I can't do it well. And I mean well, I mean doing it as if it was my mother. And I don't do it long, I exhaust quickly because caring for other people is expensive. And I'm not just talking about money. I'm not just talking about money. Don't go there. I'm not just talking about how much it costs. Although money is in there, it's expensive to care for people. Yeah. He, this, this, the man in this story, the innkeeper, he was a businessman, right? He made money providing lodging for paying customers. He wasn't in a hospital. He wasn't there to be a nonprofit. He, he was there to make money. Let's be clear about that. That's how he made his business. So, so to take care of this man who could not pay me meant he was losing money. He was losing space. He was losing time. He was losing upkeep. I have a lodging. I have a hotel that is designed to make money for temporary travelers to come through. And in return for the space that I give them, I get paid. That's how I make my money. And now a need has been dropped off on my doorstep that I don't get any money from. And I'm a businessman. And to me, if it don't make money, it don't make sense. <laughs> this was inconvenient. It was inconvenient. The whole, the whole setup, the fact that you, I didn't plan my day for you to bring this need and drop it on my doorstep. I am a businessman, and so this innkeeper, understand, was in the business of taking care of people. He wasn't in the heart place. This was about money. It was inconvenient. And here's what I understand about ministry. You don't always know the cost of serving God through serving people. That what they didn't tell me, Adrian, when I came into ministry is that there's a hidden cost to doing ministry well. See, see, they didn't tell me all the things. That, see, 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 when they said to whom much is given, much is required, that was a shouting point. <laughs> that who much is given, much required, that was a shouting point for being in ministry. But I didn't know that there were hidden costs in ministry, that, that, that there were things that didn't show up on the line items in the budget sheet, that there was no invoice that could be submitted for because there was no real way to quantify what it costs you, but I want to tell somebody there is a cost. 
that they didn't tell me, Adrian, that when you gave into ministry, that there were things that I didn't see. I didn't know that there would be attacks. I didn't know that there would be lies. I didn't know that there would be difficult. I didn't know that there would be misunderstandings. I didn't know that if you preach right, it didn't mean that everybody treats you right. I didn't know that just because you said yes to the Lord, I didn't really know what I was saying yes to. That when God said, go preach or go minister, I said yes in my heart without really knowing uh, uh, how much it was going to cost what I was saying yes to. I didn't know I was saying yes to heartbreak. I didn't know I was saying yes to heartache. I didn't know I was saying yes to people who would attack you for having no real reason. I didn't know I was saying yes to people who misunderstood you or were trying to do good. I didn't know I was saying yes to being lonely, to being frustrated, to being misunderstood. I didn't know I was saying yes to being ostracized and often criticized and often overlooked and understated and overlooked. I didn't know I was saying yes to all that. I thought I was just saying yes to grab a microphone and take a text and start preaching. I didn't know I was saying yes to nights walking the floor wondering, Lord, what are we going to do? I didn't know I was saying yes to attacks on your family, on your physical health, and on your relational health. I didn't know I was saying yes to things that I did. I didn't know. There was no way I could quantify. So even when somebody offered to pay you a salary to do what you do, I, didn't even, I wasn't even able to give them an accurate uh, 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 understanding of how much it would cost because there were things that I did not see. How many people know what I'm talking about? That, that, that when I said yes to go and help somebody, I didn't know that there were hidden things in there, things that weren't revealed to me, things I didn't see. And perhaps if I had seen it, I would have probably said no. I would have said no if they said, I want you to go when it's inconvenient for you. I want you to stay there all night. And I want you to handle, handhold them. I want you to care for them. I want you to be there. I want you to support them. I want you to pray for them. And so instead of me praying for myself at 2 in the morning, I'm walking around with your burdens on my heart at 2 in the morning. I didn't know that I'd be stretched from here to there, that sometimes I would be stretched between my own needs, my own issues, my own challenges, and yet trying to work other people through their needs and their challenges, and that sometimes what they were going through conflict what I was going through. I didn't know that sometimes I'd be, had to be the first one there and the last one to leave. I didn't know that I had to spend long nights and long days. I didn't know that I would have to give up things that I wanted to do. To be available, to be accessible, to be effective so that someone else could be good at what they do. Can I talk here? Uh, we, so, so most people that go into ministry come into ministry with great grand ideas of what ministry looks like. So they see cars and they see homes and they see jets and they see uh, accolades and they see VIP seating and they see all these uh, what I call trappings of being in leadership, Deacon James. They see all the externals, and so most people are drawn into ministry because they're pulled in by all those external things, and nobody told them that there is a hidden cost to this. That if you really do it right, that, that it's really going to cost you in ways that you can't even quantify, I can't even explain to you what it really costs. And people tickle me to have those. Remember they used to have those pastoral anniversaries and they had the pastoral anniversary and they would present the pastor with a gift and say, Pastor, we raised this money and wanted to give it to you. And the pastor would nervously receive it and say, thank you. But really, when you really think about what it cost you personally, the things you can't explain, the things that you can't talk about, the things you had to give up, the times you had to walk away from the needs of your own children so that someone else's children would be blessed. The time that you stood there and counseled and struggled and helped people get through their marital issues while you were having issues of your own. The times that you went to the hospital and you sat there and you prayed with them even though you needed to be in the hospital bed yourself. The moments when you were trying to struggle with them through a mental breakdown, a crisis, not knowing that you had to, you were trying to get through a mental breakdown and crisis yourself. The times you sang and you worshiped and you ministered and you helped other people and in reality, you needed to be on the altar yourself receiving from the ministry of worship. The times we preached when you needed to be preached to, these are the hidden costs that are in, that are baked into the yes. How many of you have said yes to the Lord? 
that, 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 you've, that, that, that God has wrestled with you and he's called you and he's ministered to you and he's spoken to you in dreams and in visions and he's telling you what he wants you to do. And maybe some of you have been running for years from the calling of God in your life, not just to preach, not just to sing, but just to call the surrender to God. And when you finally said yes to the Lord and you threw up your hands, nobody told you that there were some hidden costs. <laughs> Am I talking to anybody this morning? Oh, for the hidden cause. If they just told me it was going to be like this, I might have said no. But I said yes to it anyway, and now I'm in a position to minister and to serve. That's why, that's why you can't be in this for the money. You can't be. It, 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 I'm not saying you shouldn't be compensated, but that shouldn't be your first conversation. Because in reality, whatever you're, whatever you're given as a salary or as a contract does not even begin to cover what it really costs. The preparation, not just to do your job, but the personal preparation, the personal consecration, the times where God has you on your face praying when other people are playing. Would you rather be out doing something else, but the Holy Spirit has pulled you into a place, into a secret place where my life, my proclivity, my, my flesh wants to be doing one thing, but my spirit is saying I need you to be doing something else. Where, where, where you want to be having a good time and running around but something has grabbed you by the neck and said I need you here I need you in a position of prayer I need you in a posture of prayer I need you reading your Bible I want to watch TV I want to watch something stupid I want to watch something silly I want to see what's going on with Cardi B and them I want to be watching The Real Housewives but something has told me to turn this TV off because I want to talk to you and while I'm trying to do something else God is talking to me about something else and there's are hidden costs I wish I could tell you what it's going to cost you but I can't because there's a hidden cost one successful preacher was asked this he said what does it cost to be an effective minister what does it cost they saw him on grand stages they saw him on big events they saw him bringing souls to Christ and they asked him what does it cost to be an effective minister and his answer was Everything. That in reality it cost me everything. To really do ministry on the level that he has called me to do, you don't get portions, you don't get parts, but it costs you everything. And in, in the story, Jesus demonstrates this with his own life. With his own life, he demonstrated what it costs to do ministry. He saw a world full of sinners that were stripped of their divine identity. And they were wounded by sin. And they were unable to rise. Sin had taken over and beaten us down so that we were unable to rise up and to answer the call of God. That even if I did want to, I didn't have the propensity. I didn't have the power. I didn't have the passion. I didn't have the ability that I was just like this man who was stripped of my divine identity. If you remember that man was made in the image of God and Adam was made in the image of God because of sin, they were stripped of the divine identity and they were left on the side of the road, wounded and unable to rise up by themselves. But thank God that like this Samaritan, Jesus came down to us. And aren't you glad for a God who will come down to you? Who will not demand that you come up to him, that you get your life right, that you get yourself together. But we serve a God that will come down where you are. That he'll come down to the drug house. He'll come down to the sin that you're in. He'll come down. This man got off of his beast. And unlike the priest who avoided the issue, and unlike the Levite who found another way to get around it, he came right where you are. How many of you are glad that God came right where you are? He didn't wait for you to get it together. He didn't wait for you to get your mind right. He didn't wait for you to get your money right. He didn't wait for you to start wearing the right clothes. He didn't wait for you to start acting right, but he came right where I was. How many of you are glad that God came where I was? When he found me I was a mess and I was a wretch undone and I had a reefer in my pocket and I had alcohol in my body and I was running around chasing everything I could find but he didn't wait for me to get to be a deacon or a minister or a pastor but he came right where I was. He came right in the club. He came right in the strip joint. He came right when I was doing dirt and said hey I want to talk to you. How many are glad that God found you where you was? He came, he came down. 
He came down. I'm so glad we serve a God who sits high, but he looks low and that he will come down. That's what Jesus did. He stripped himself of his glory and he took on the form of a man and it became in the form of a man and came down to us. He came down to the human experience. He came down to a people who couldn't reach up to him. And here he began to put oil and wine. Here he began to minister. He didn't minister from glory. He came right down to where you were and began to minister and bind up your wounds. And oh God, put me in a safe place. We serve a God that will put you in safe places. That he makes an investment in you. That he snatches you out of something. And begin to bond up the things that are really killing you. See, the things that are really hurting us are not what's external. It's what's internal. And God has a way of healing your wounds. The wounds from your past. The issues in your mind. The things that trouble you. The things that nobody's been able to fix. Alcohol couldn't fix it. And sex couldn't fix it. And therapists couldn't fix it. And I appreciate therapists. If you need it, go get it. But there are some things that only God can fix. And only God can change. And he began to pour in the oil and the wine like this good Samaritan. And he took me to a safe place. He didn't just give me a wound. He didn't just buy my wounds and pour in medicine and say, see you later. But God took the care of walking me all the way through. And I'm so glad that we serve a God who doesn't just start something and don't finish it. That he will walk you all the way through the process. That he which hath begun a good work in you shall perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That if God ever gets started on your life, he says, I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to stick with you. I'm going to stay with you until healing is complete. That's the problem many people. We have people who abandon us before the job is complete. We have people who get tired, who give out, who wear out, who say, okay, I've done enough. I'm going to go on my way. But this man, at his own personal expense, came down off his beast and now he put the man on his beast in other words we switched places I came down so that you could come up and that's what Jesus is saying to some of you I came down I stripped myself of glory I put myself on a cross so that you could get up I became poor so that you could be rich we came to switch places I started to call this message trading places because that's what God said I did for you I knew you couldn't get up I knew you couldn't get out I knew you couldn't be free I knew you was in trouble so what we did was we traded places I went down so that you could get up is there anybody glad that he got you the power to get up I became poor so that you could be rich I switched places with you is there anybody glad that Jesus switched places with you truth be told he was beaten and laid on a cross but it should have been me he was the one who was beaten all night long but it should have been me he was the one that suffered in pain but in reality it should have been me but he went to a cross so that I wouldn't have to be crucified that way is there anybody can give God 30 seconds for switching places is with you I deserve to die I deserve to be beaten I deserve to be ostracized but he took my place is there anybody that's glad that he took your place he took on the wrath of God so that you could have the mercy of God somebody give God praise 30 seconds for mercy mercy paid the cost and here he took us to safe places and that's what the inn was. It was a safe place. And that's what the church is supposed to be. It's supposed to be a safe place. A safe place. It is the repository that God places us in as he, as he delivered you from a life of sin. That he doesn't deliver you from sin for you to go back to the club. He didn't snatch you off of the stripper pole for you to go back to the strip club. He didn't deliver the taste of alcohol out of your mouth for you to go back to a lifestyle that he died to deliver you from. And so for those who say that the church has no relevance and no importance, I beg to differ. 
that though it has its issues and has its problems and has its challenges, it is the divinely appointed repository where God takes his people who have been wounded by sin and places them in the room with other people. And what I'm so glad about is he didn't place me in the room with people who could not relate to what I went through. That the church is not for perfect people. Imperfect people are wanted here. This is not for the got it together folks who never had, a, had an issue, folks who never made a mistake, folks. That the church is a repository for people who have also been wounded, who have also lived in sin, who has also been delivered from something. That everybody in here has been delivered from something. That there, there's something somewhere in your life that God has delivered you from that nobody in here has the ability to put your nose down on anybody because every person I see and every soul I see and every woman I see and every man I see has been touched by sin in some way. And so for us to act funny with strangers is really a bad thing because all of us can relate to what it's like to have sin in your life. Come on, talk to me. So I want somebody in here who's been delivered from anything to give God a praise right here. If God, if God brought you out of anything, and, 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 see, that's the problem with church folks. After you've been saved for a while, Tao, we begin to forget what it was like to be a sinner. We begin to forget what it was like to be bound and be tied up. But I want somebody in here who doesn't have short memory and who can appreciate what God has done in your life to give God some kind of praise right here for what he's brought you out of. If he brought you out of anything, I need you to give God a praise right here. If he brought you out of anything, if he brought you off of drugs, if he brought you out of promiscuity, if he brought you out of alcohol, if he brought you out of anything, would you give God 30 seconds of praise for God bringing me out of something? I'm so glad he brought me out of something. It's expensive, but he paid the cost. Write this down. Number two, it is exhausting. Being a caregiver is exhausting. There's a phenomenon called caregiver burden syndrome. It's also known as caregiver burnout or caregiver stress. And it is a state of physical, emotional, and mental exhaustion that is experienced by many who care for loved ones who are aging or are chronically ill. The many people who have been thrust into the responsibility of being the caregiver for someone that they love, whether it's an aging parent or a child that has gotten to some kind of chronically ill situation. And I say this all the time, we really need to pray for people who take care of other people. Yeah. We really need to pray for people who care for other people because the assumption is that they don't need support. Yeah. And they do. Because I'm carrying my issues, my problems, my finances, my marriage, the things that I'm burdened with, which, is, which in and of itself sometimes can be exhausting. And now I'm taking on this other person. And, and people don't really understand how exhausting yeah. it can be. It can be. Exhausting. Draining. Draining. And, 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 and listen, listen, listen. And the guilt of feeling exhausted. This is my mother. This is my father. This is my grandparent. And, and, and so I, I'm carrying them. It's exhausting. And now I'm burdened with the uh, guilt of feeling exhausted. Yeah, help us. Help us. With caring for another person. Help us. That's why church people don't do it long for other people. Yeah. Because caring people can be exhausting. You call me every week with the same issue. I'm at the hospital every week. I'm trying to get you out of something every time. I'm, I'm saying the same words to you. I'm having altar call with you every Sunday to pray about the same issue. I'm getting the same phone call, and it's exhausting. But when I see your name come up, I still answer the phone because I'm a caregiver. And I've been called to take care of this responsibility. And so I had to put aside whatever I'm dealing with, whatever I'm going through, to be there for you and for you and for you. Now, if you're somebody who don't care about people, if you don't bother with people, if it's just about me, you don't understand nothing I'm talking about. Just go to sleep. I'm not even talking to you, but I'm talking to everybody in here who God has placed you in a place where you are the designated caregiver, that you are the Joseph in your family, that you are the one that God has designated to be the one to be the giver. And I'm going to tell you something right now. I thank God that God has blessed me to be the giver and not have to be the receiver. 
I'd rather be the one having to give money than to need money. I'd rather be the one that could give help and give support rather than need support. You don't hear me up in here. I'd rather be the one having to be the lender and not the borrower. And though it's exhausting and though it gets on my nerves and though I fuss sometimes and though I kick and though I will admit sometimes that God, why me? God said, why not you? Would you rather be the one giving or the one need the money? You have been destined, you have been called, you have been gifted, you have been anointed, but it can be exhausting. It can be exhausting. And the assumption is, is that if you're a support, somebody said, well, that's your job. Yeah, yeah. You're supposed to do that. You're supposed to. You're the pastor. You're the deacon. You're the mother. <laughs> you're the mama in this house. You're the daddy in this house. But just because you've been given the responsibility doesn't mean you're not human. Come on, I'm a human being. I'm a person. I give out. I'm not an unlimited source. I do get tired. I do got to take a nap. I do got to go to the bathroom. I do want to do something that I want to do. I do want to have fun. I want to go on vacation. And it can be exhausting. Yeah. I'm talking to somebody in here that God has put you in a position to be a minister, a caregiver, and yeah. a supporter. But you're exhausted. Talk to us. Help you're exhausted. The question is, who cares for the caregiver? Yeah, that's a good question. If you are in the situation where you are the go-to person, who cares for the go-to person? Where does the go-to person to go to? <laughs> where is it? They always call me. I'm the favorite auntie. I'm the favorite uncle. God knows I've been blessed. And they always call my number. But the question is, where does the person who gives the care, where, where do they go to? Where, where do they go to have their needs met? Where do they go to have somebody to talk to? And, 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 and what I found is that the more responsibility you've been given, the fewer places that you have to go to be poured into. I'm going to say it again. That the higher you go, the more responsibility you've given, that it gets very narrow. You don't have many people that you can share real issues with. That that group of people that you can be real with and be down with and tell your secrets and shows your scars to Daphne gets very small. Gets small. Yeah, that as long as you're common and amongst the rest of them and just hanging out, you can find a whole lot of people. But the more God puts blessings on you and favor upon you, you realize that you can't tell everything to everybody. Yeah, you can't tell them your struggles. You can't tell them your issues. And it it creates a dilemma when you become in leadership because on the one hand, you can't talk to the people that you lead because you might lose respect. So, talking. But the people that you really need to talk to and be honest with, you have to be careful because some of them can be critical and some of them can be jealous and some of them could be Saul. Come on. Who may be jealous of your advancement in your position and they don't want to really see you get up. So when you share things with them, they're ready to kill you or ostracize you or spread your business or be shocked. And so the people that I can talk to and really be really real and be a hundred with become smaller the more God elevates you. Oh, God. This ain't a leadership church church, but I thought I'd go there. The, the, the circle gets smaller. That's good. The people I can be honest with and tell my truth and not hear about it next week gets smaller. The people I can be naked with and transparent with and say, this is where I'm hurting at. This is what I'm going through. And so as a caregiver, I am being squeezed between extremes of still being available to those who need me and yet choking for the lack of air myself. Watch it. Am I talking to anybody in here? That I'm a mama, I'm supposed to be a mama. This is my responsibility, but mama got needs too. Yeah. Huh? Come on, talk to me. I'm a wife and I'm supposed to be a caregiver and I'm supposed to be the fragrance of the house, but I got needs too. That I'm a father, I'm supposed to be there and bear the weight and the load and responsibility of taking on this family. But I got needs too. And here I am trying to be somebody who's available to somebody else when nobody's available to me. And when I really want to talk, I want to pick up the phone and I go, I can't call them. I ain't got nobody to call. My friendship circle is getting thinner. 
Oh, when I was a sinner, I was running the street. I had all kind of roadies and homies and homegirls and homeboys. We, we rolled. We were like a crew. We rolled 20 deep. But the closer I get to God and the more serious I became about my walk and the more I was concerned about who I'm supposed to be, that my words and my group got thinner and thinner. I started out with 20. I'm down to two. Uh And they're questionable. Yeah, I'm down to the last two, and I'm getting nervous because I'm, I'm, I'm taking on more water, but I'm having fewer people to help me carry the water that I'm carrying. Come on. And I'm getting exhausted. And I understand why people who call themselves ministers don't really do it because you want a title. You don't want the work. You ain't really want to do it. You're cool as long as it's VIP, but you ain't really there when it matters to people. Oh. And I found out if you're not there when it matters to people, then you don't matter. Uh-oh. You don't matter. Yes, sir. Anybody can be there when you're dancing and rejoicing and celebrating. Anybody can be there when things are going up for you. Yeah. I tell people all the time, the same phone number that worked when I was going up is the same phone number that worked when I was going down. What's wrong with your phone? My number ain't changed. It's the same number I had going up. It's the same number I had going down. It's the same number I had when I was broke. It's the same number when I had plenty. What's wrong with your phone? Yes. Yes, sir. One thousand. God cares for the caregiver. Yes, sir. God knows how to reach you when you're at the point of exhaustion. God knows how to speak to your mind and give you peace when you're about to lose all your peace. And God will speak peace to you when nobody else knows what to say to you. Come on, come on, Doc. I'm talking to my caregivers in here. Don't get frustrated with people. Uh huh. Because the truth be told, they're not always equipped yeah, that's it. to minister to your needs. Henry, you being mad at people and talking about I was there for everybody and I was there for everybody. Hush. Hush, because just like you were there for them, God says, I'll be there for you. And just like you carried them even past the point of exhaustion, God said, I will carry you through the point of exhaustion. And when nobody else knows, see, that's why you can't, you can't, nobody knows what it costs you to be you. That's why you got to go to God, because they don't really know what you're really burdened with, what you're really carrying, what you're dealing with, that you're is hurting but I showed up anyway yes sir yes sir Doc. I'm tired but I showed up anyway Daphne I felt like going to do something else but I showed up anyway don't tell me your cat ate your dog and your cat and your... watch it bring it back face it sometimes people make up the craziest excuses for not being available uh-huh that's all I'm saying. Yeah, but while people are dying and struggling and on the edge of existence you making all crazy excuses for not being there But I'm a caregiver. It's my job. And I can't depend on you to always be there to give me what I need. But what I can depend on is God who knows what I need. Sometimes you give me something and you don't even know. (laughs) You think you know what I need. Yeah. Well, God really knows what I need. Somebody lift your hands here and say, Lord, give me what I need. Give me what I need. Give me what I, aren't you glad that God will not leave you out there just pouring out, but don't know how to pour back in? Lift your hands, give God glory, say, Lord, you know what I need. Yes. That the church is like a gas station. We come here for a fill up. That I don't come here to play games, and I don't come here to see who came, and I don't come here just because it's Sunday. But I came to get a fill up because when I leave these doors and go out to work next week, I'm going to deal with the devil. I'm going to deal with the demon. I'm going to deal with issues. I'm going to deal with trauma. That's why I don't play when it comes to ministering the word of God on a Sunday morning because somebody came to get a fill up for the issues I got to deal with when I leave here. I came to get everything I need. Somebody lift your hands and say, Lord, fill me up. Yeah, fill me up. Fill me up. My t- tank is on E. I'm riding on fumes. I'm about to collapse. I'm about to quit. I got my hair done and my feet done. I got my fancy suit on, but they don't know how close I am to absolutely collapsing, to blowing out my brains, to giving up on my life and everything I love. And when I come to church, I ain't got time to play with you. I don't have time to play with the worship. I need 
a filler. And if that's you, would you lift your hand and begin to worship right here and say, Lord, fill me up. But I want to also say this last thing. That though it is exhausting and though it is expensive, Adrian, it's enriching. It is enriching. Look how much faith this man required to offer service, not even knowing for sure if he'd be compensated. Not knowing for sure. The innkeeper was left there. The Samaritan said, here, here's some money. And when I get back, well, when is that? <laughs> when you get back, is that a week? I'm good for a couple of days. But now you're talking about when I get back that you will compensate me. So the daily expenses of caring for this man are continuing. And I'm there every day changing his sheets, caring for his wounds, giving him a free room, making sure he's eating his meals. And all I've been left with is a promise of when you get back. And I'm serving as if I'm going to get paid tomorrow, but it's been a month. You gave me a promise and took off and I haven't even seen you. No correspondence, no letter, no email, no confirmation, no prophetic word. I'm doing what you asked me to do. I'm caring for an ailing person. I'm giving out of my resources. I'm giving him a room. I'm losing money. Every day this man sits in that room, that's a day I miss money. That space is reserved for paying customers. But I continue to do it and I continue to serve and I continue to minister not knowing when. That's what faith is. I'm doing it not knowing when. I'm not sure when he's going to get back. I'm not sure when I'm going to receive. I'm not sure when I'm going to be recompensed. I'm not sure when I'm going to be reimbursed. I'm not even sure if I'm going to be reimbursed. All I got is a promise. And I want to talk to somebody here that God has called you to serve him. And all you got is a promise. Sometimes you're serving with no prophetic word, no confirmation. Nobody tapping you on the back. Nobody calling you out. I'm just serving faithfully, dutifully, doing what I'm called to do because he called me to. See? I'm trying to tell you that's why you can't get into it for the money because for what it really costs you God said you got to wait till I beg back but when is that and I'm talking to somebody here who is standing on a promise all I got is a promise that he gonna straighten me out <laughs> all I got is a promise that after a while, he's going to break me off something. All I got is a word that I'm hanging on to. And so here's the, here's, here's the task. I'm going to do it with the same energy, although it's been a long time coming. See, most people can do it for a little while, but most people lack the elasticity, the endurance to keep on serving and keep on preaching and keep on ministering at the same level until he comes. Most people would get into it, and I've got a lot of, and I see people volunteer all the time. They have a lot of energy at first, because I'm optimistic that whatever I give out, I'm going to get back. But if something don't happen real quick, if this marriage don't straighten out quick, if these kids don't get their stuff together quick, if something doesn't happen in my life quick, if this job doesn't change quick, then I'm going to lose my energy and lose my enthusiasm and lose my calling and lose my nerve and lose my patience because it hasn't happened quick. So look how much faith this man had to have to continue to give care to this person that's been dropped off on my doorstep. And I'm expected to continue to minister and pour in wine and change bandages and change sheets and provide meals. But here's the strange thing that happened. At first, he might have been doing it for the money. I give him that. At first, he might have been doing it out of obligation and duty. At first, he might have been doing it because somebody challenged him to, but somewhere in the midst of him doing it, his motivation for doing it changed. And his motivation was not accolades or even money. His motivation was by seeing somebody under my care and under my ministry be transformed because of my hospitality. 
And I want to question somebody here right now. How many people are being transformed or being impacted because of your hospitality? That, that your ministry has been being there for somebody else. But my reward is seeing that person's life being radically changed. You know why nobody's shouting? Because if a message ain't about you, you don't think it's for you. If it ain't about your money, your kids, your prosperity, your elevation, you don't want to hear it. But here God is saying that even though you may not have gotten the outward external uh, uh, reward from what you're doing, it's so enriching. So at some point going into ministry was about one thing, but it has changed Deacon James to something else. Now the motivation is to see people grow, to see people change, to see people's lives enriched, to see people people elevate and the joy I get is when I see you getting strong the, the, the reward that I receive right now is seeing you transform you came in broken you came in worried and you came in frustrated and you came in suicidal and you came in wanting to quit and give up but somehow in the midst of the ministry you are strengthening and I see you somebody that I once was carrying is now carrying me somebody that I was supporting is now supporting me and the reward I get the enrichment I receive is seeing you be strong Seeing you stand up, seeing you speak in faith, seeing you celebrate God. Would you give God a praise that God doesn't leave you always broken? That there's a transformation, oh God. There's a transformation going on right now in this room that somebody who came in broke, busted, and disgusted, suddenly now I'm a prayer warrior, and I'm a minister, and I'm a preacher, and now I'm somebody that people can call, and I ain't got to always call you, oh my God. For the fact that God won't let you always be the tail, but you'll suddenly transform and be the head. Give God praise if you're receiving the oil right now. That's why we have to have radical hospitality. That's why we got to step over our old idiosyncrasies and our issues and to minister to other people in spite of in spite of what I may be going through. And when I look out there and I see you who was barely making it and now you standing, it says my ministry was worth it, Connie. When I see you who was suicidal, when I see you who was about to break down and because of our singing or because of our preaching or because of our class, and maybe it's none of those stage gifts. Maybe it was just somebody giving a kind word. Just a kind word. I love people who are consistent. Yeah. Every Sunday when I see you, you always say, good morning, good to see you. And you did it the week before. Good morning, good to see you. And it's six weeks later. Good morning, good to see you. And you don't know that just your consistency is helping somebody. Just your consistency. It don't have to be big. It's just consistent. Wishy-washy people get on my nerves, and they make me nervous. And I can't deal with people. I got to take your temperature every week. I got to take your temperature to see if I can speak to you. What we need in the church of God are consistent people. It's hard for me too, but I'm still going to be consistent. I'm going to be consistently nice to you, consistently available to you, consistently have a kind word because you don't know what people are going through when they walk in the room. And when I walk in the room and that one usher who always hugs me is a ministry to me. They don't even know it. Just that one usher. She ain't on the stage. She ain't singing. She ain't preaching. But just her saying consistently to me, I love you, Pastor. It ministers. Look at somebody say, I'm praying for you today. I'm, I'm praying for you today. But thank God. This is what I like about God. God is never going to leave himself owing any man anything. He's not going to ever leave you with a blank check that he can't cash. And so here was the promise he gave to the innkeeper. Whatever it costs you. When I get back, I'll pay you. Whatever it costs you, 
I'm not even sure what all it costs you. I don't know the cost of your bandages. I don't know the cost of your food. I don't know the cost of cleaning the room and reletting. I don't know, but whatever it costs you, I'll pay you back. Whatever it costs you. Now, and I, I hear God saying to somebody in here that you've paid some costs that nobody really even understands. That nobody even knows. It costs you to be a good wife cost you. So you single people want to jump in and get married real quick because they don't know there's a cost. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a, for all my married people saying amen. There's a cost associated with walking around with a ring on your hand saying I'm somebody's wife. Yeah, yeah. And most people want the prize but they don't want to pay the cost. See what I'm saying? They want the title but they don't want to pay the cost. But here is God saying that whatever it costs you to take care of somebody else, when I get back, I'm going to repay you. And I'll repay you in ways that no man could possibly repay you. And I know you have needs and I know you have issues and I know you have challenges. But sitting right around you right now, I have strategically positioned you next to somebody who has a need that may be even greater than your own. You've been so self-absorbed and selfish and worrying about you that you never even thought that the person sitting next to you is going through something that they can't even speak about. And I just want to use you for a moment to speak to them. And I, I hear you saying, God, I can't give out no more. If I give out more now, I'm not going to have nothing for me. And God said, whatever it costs you, I'm going to pay it back. I'm not talking about your bank account. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about ways, that stuff that you paid that nobody can't even understand. You don't even understand what I'm saying. I'm not even sure if I'm talking to the right people in here. But I'm keeping a record. I'm keeping a record of everything you have done to build my body, to minister to somebody else, to speak a word of encouragement. I'm keeping a ledger. And whatever it costs you, I'm going to pay it back. So here, so here's what I've been called to do to challenge you. Take somebody by the hand sitting next to you. Just take them by the hand. Squeeze their hand. Squeeze their hand real good. And for the next 30 seconds, all I want you to do is begin to pray everything you can on that person. Just, just pray. Forget about yourself for a minute. Forget about your needs for a minute. Forget about your Santa Claus list you came in with. And I want you to just step over what you're going through and begin to minister to that person and everything God puts in your spirit, begin to pray for that person. Come on, let's go. Let's go. This is radical. This is radical. This ain't what you came for. This is radical. I'm praying for your kids. I'm praying for your marriage. I'm praying for your job. I'm praying for your mental health. I'm, pray I'm, praying, I'm praying for your kid as if it was my kid. I'm praying about your marriage as if it's my marriage. I'm praying about your financial needs as hard as I'm praying. You're not praying. You're not praying. Pray everything that God puts in your spirit. Pray everything. Pray everything. Everything come to your mind. Begin to speak it. Speak it. Speak it right here. Let the Lord use you. Pour out. Pour out. Pour out. Let the tears flow as if you were praying for your own finances. 
Let the tears flow as if you were praying for your own healing. I'm praying for your healing from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. I'm praying for divine healing to break out in your family. I'm praying for resources to come to you. I'm praying for favor right now. I'm praying for healing to come into your house. He told Shamaha, if you've got a prayer language, I need you praying in your prayer language right here. I need you to let the Holy Ghost take over and begin to speak. The Holy Spirit knows what you don't know. When you run out of understanding, and you don't know even what to say let the Holy Ghost take over and begin to minister to them I know I know it's hard to step over your own needs I know it's hard to get out of your own way but give me just give me a minute right here and take all the focus off of you and begin to pray about them you don't even know you don't know you don't know the hidden costs you don't know what it costed me just to come here today you don't know everything in me said don't come don't serve don't show up don't be there and if i do be there i'm going to get the very minimum service and i'm not going to sit somewhere where they don't bother me don't touch me hallelujah there's a hidden cost i didn't know i was going to run into i made secret sacrifices i have unseen service but god said i'm going to use that person to pour into you come on Come on, come on, come on. Whatever you got, whatever you got, begin to pour. Hallelujah, my back is hurt, but I feel strength. My feet are hurting, but I feel strength. I feel ignored and overlooked. I feel disrespected, but I feel God pouring in right now. Pour in, Jesus. Are you doing it? Are you doing it? Are you doing it? Oh, it's, it's radical. But let the Lord use you to be his minister today. Are you doing it? Are you doing it? Somebody's got to make a phone call when they leave today. You've been waiting for them to call you. You got to call them and just minister. Just serve. Just support. Just speak a word. Well, Pastor, they ain't spoke to me in years. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about you. You think God gave that to you just for you? Pour it out. There it is. There it is. There it is. There it is. And right when you feel like you've come to the end of your prayer and you feel exhausted and you feel like you're giving out everything you can, then I want you to focus on yourself and open up your own heart and say, Lord, now pour it back in. Come on, somebody, pour it back in. Lift your hands right here and pour it back in. Come on, matter of fact, stand on your feet all over this building and say, Lord, pour it back in. Pour it back in. I pour it out now, Lord. I need you to pour it back in. Receive. Come on, lift your hands and let the Lord pour it back in. Pour it back in. Pour it back in. Pour it back in. I've given, I've served, I've ministered. I've helped. I've been there. And now, Lord, pour it back in. Hallelujah. Sing, children. I want to see you. I see the Lord coming to somebody right
I've been disrespected, but I'm going to pay you back. feel the Lord ministering to somebody who's been ministering to other people. I feel the Lord giving strength to somebody who's been strengthening other people. If that's you, lift your hands, begin to worship him right here. Just, just receive this moment. Receive this, receive this moment. Help is coming to you right now. You've been radical about it. You've been there. You've helped. You've carried. And now God says, I'm here to carry you. You're not going to collapse. You're not going to fall apart. You're not going to break down. You're not going to commit suicide. You're not going to leave your post. You're not going to leave your position. I'm sending help to you right now. Right now. Right now. Your needs are being met right now. Whatever you need, wisdom is coming to you right now. Answers are coming to you right now. Help is coming to you right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lift your hands again to say, Holy, Holy, Listen, open your mouth. I need every person here to open your mouth to the Lord. I need every person to lift your hands up and open your mouth to the Lord right here. Right here. Right here. For somebody, this is your opportunity to take a good, long drink right here. Come on, drink this in. Drink this in. I came to give you strength. I came to give you courage. I came to repay you. You've been carrying it for a long time. You've been carrying it for a long time. And I came to give you strength right here. This is your moment. This is your opportunity. 
to get what you need from the Lord. This is your moment. This between you and God. Don't worry about these people. They don't even know what you've been carrying. They don't even know what you've been thinking. They don't even know about the war that's been going on on your head. They don't even know how close you were to collapsing. They don't even know how close you were to giving up. But right here and right now, God said, yeah. Come on, take this for yourself. This is a moment to be selfish. This is a moment to be selfish. Get what you need. Get what you need. This is your opportunity to be selfish. You're going to need this next week. You're going to need this when you get back home. You're going to need this when you get back to that job. Your God is not unrighteous to forget your labor of love and that you have ministered and do minister to the saints. God said, I ain't forgot you. Woo! Thank you, Lord. I haven't forgotten you. I have forgotten about you. 